Now that we've covered some of the basic terminology associated with lithic analysis, let's move on to talk about formal tool analysis and the characteristics or attributes that you should know. As you already know, flint napping, in flint napping, flakes can be removed to make formal tools, which have recurring combinations of attributes. But there's other types of tools that seem more informal, on the spot, and practical. We call these expedient tools, tools without recurring combinations of attributes. But let's talk today about bifacial points in particular, a very common type of formal tool. Because we closely analyze points, we differentiate a lot of attributes. To begin with, bifaces, bifacial points can be divided into two basic parts, the blade and the hafting area. And when you have a stem, the hafting area is quite obvious, as you see on the left. But even when you don't have a stem, there is still a hafting area where the point was attached to a shaft. The base of the biface is called the proximal end, whereas the tip is called the distal end. Some of the many attributes that might be examined in analysis of bifacial tools include the shape of the various parts, the dimensions, the raw material that was used, whether any grinding was done to deliberately remove a sharp edge, patterns of resharpening, and even flaking patterns. Dimensions at their most simplest would be the length, the total length of the point, the widest width, and the thickness. But as you can see from this diagram, potentially you could take many different dimensions, including the dimension of just the blade alone and of just the hafting area. A number of basic biface shapes have been recognized. From left to right, these include bifurcate, lanceolate, notched, pentagonal, stemmed, and triangular. Stemmed points have three basic stem shapes, straight stem, expanding stem, and contracting stem. Although, as you can see at the bottom illustration, you may also distinguish rounded stems and pointed stems. Here I illustrate actual points. On the left, a straight stem in which the sides of the stem are more or less parallel. In an expanding stem point in the bottom center, the base of the stem is wider than the top of the stem up near the shoulders. And in a contracting stem point, the base is smaller than up at the top where it is near the shoulders. You may also look at the shapes of bases as well as the treatment of the bases. For example, were they ground, were they beveled? We additionally often look at the blade shape up at the top and the treatment of that edge. Here, for example, is a recurvate shape like this and a serrated edge like this. The flaking patterns may be distinctive, such as this oblique transverse flaking, which takes a great deal of skill. The shape or cross-section of the bifacial point may be distinctive. An example of this are Dalton points. Dalton points are rhomboid in cross-section because when they sharpen the edges, like this edge, they sharpen them unifacially. So they struck this edge on the opposite side, flakes came off on this side. When they sharpened this edge, they struck it on this side and flakes came off on the opposite side, resulting in a rhomboidal cross-section. Unifaces, that is tools that were worked only on one side, end up with plano-convex cross-sections. So flaking was initiated on the bottom and flakes came off this side only. 
The choice of raw material has a number of implications. One, different raw materials can be worked in different ways. So if you would like to make a very large, very thin type of biface, not every raw material lends itself to doing so. Also, the raw material may tell you whether it's a locally obtained or whether it's not local, that is exotic, that it had to be either gotten from somewhere else or traded from somewhere else. There are many different raw materials that can be used all around the world. I'll talk here about just some of the most common that you might have heard about. One of the most common that you may have heard about, or if you've tried your hand at flint napping, perhaps you began in flint napping obsidian. Chert, there are many different kinds of chert. My favorite stone. Here in South Carolina, a very common raw material is quartz. But there are many other types of raw materials, such as novaculite from Arkansas, silicified sandstone, also found here in the southeast. And I insert a picture here showing you chert as it looks coming out of the quarry on the left and as it looks after heat treating, which chemically changes it, it can change the color, the glossiness, um, and how well it can be flint napped. When we find a recurring pattern of attributes that's limited in space, time, and cultural association, we name a type. Types are usually diagnostic, that is, they can tell us the time period of the artifact. Now, of course, we're not really interested in the time period of the artifact. We're hoping that the artifact can tell us the time period of our deposit. An example of a diagnostic um, point uh, is the Snyder's point. That's the name of the type. This is a very thin, very well-made um, biface. It's found in the mid-continental United States in its diagnostic of the middle woodland, particularly the Hopewell. It's limited in space, that is in geographical distribution. It's limited in time. And we believe that it shows cultural linkages among those societies where it is found. Now types are used in seriation, which is itself a type of relative dating technique. So seriation is a technique to put artifacts in order, in sequence, based on changes in style or form through time. Based on the concept that as human behavior changes through time, so too do its material products. We have two types of seriation. Stylistic seriation, where you take one kind of artifact, like spear points, and you order them by similarities in style. And this order could reflect temporal change, or it could also reflect spatial distance from a point of origin. I'd like to point out that when archaeologists make charts like this, in America, they follow a couple of a common, um, I guess, standards. Uh, they show these in stratigraphic order. So the oldest ones are here at the bottom. And as you go upward stratigraphically, as it were, they become more recent in age. Also in America, we usually put the proximal end at the bottom and the tip or the distal end facing up. Here's another chart showing a stylistic seriation. And this one clearly shows you how points are arranged both stratigraphically from oldest beginning down here at the bottom and moving up to more recent and also showing you the space. So going across here, different areas. Here's Florida, the Atlantic Slope, the Appalachian and Piedmont. Um, and so points are arranged stratigraphically with the oldest at the bottom. They're arranged geographically. Each shape has been given a type name and each type is limited in space and time. The second kind of seriation is called frequency seriation. And in this type of seriation, instead of ordering one kind of artifact, you order an entire assemblage. That is the entire collection of 
lithic tools or bifaces, or in this case, from this illustration, tombstone decorations from the entire site. We assume, as we did before, a rise and fall in popularity of styles or types through time. But here we recognize that each style is rising and falling at its own rate. Thus, if you found only death's heads on all the gravestones in your cemetery up here in New England, then you are around in this time period, 1720s through the 1750s. But if instead you find, let's say, 80, 85% death's head and 20% cherub, you are in the 1760s. So it's the relative uh, frequencies, percentages, and you end up illustrating this with bar graphs that we call battleship shaped curves. I particularly appreciate this illustration because the entire illustration itself is in the shape of a gravestone and um, it's showing us three different types of decorations, death's heads, cherubs, urn, and willow. So in the center it shows us the frequency seriation, but very cleverly around the edge it shows us that during the, this long length of time, 1720s through the 1780s, that the death's head decoration is found, it stylistically was changing. So around the edge, it shows you the stylistic seriation of one of the decorations. Very well done. Seriation only allows you to put artifacts or assemblages in order, but it doesn't tell you which is the oldest, and it also doesn't tell you the actual dates. So you need to find stratified deposits through which the stratigraphy can tell you which is older and which is younger. Additionally, you need to date one of each type of artifact to be directly or indirectly dated using an absolute dating technique. So I've strayed a little bit perhaps from talking about formal tools versus expedient tools and concentrating on the attributes of formal tool analysis.